You're listening to Safety Unlocked. I'm Tim Neubauer, and our special guest today is Dr. Sally Spencer Thomas. Sally, would you like to tell our listeners uh, uh, who you are and what we're going to talk about today? Sure, Tim. Thank you so much for having me on and highlighting this really important issue. Hello, everybody. I'm a psychologist by training, and I am also a suicide loss survivor. I lost my brother to suicide in 04. And that put me on a trajectory to really start to figure out some gap filling things to help people um, live through uh, difficult and despairing times in their life. And ultimately, that leads me into working in safety critical industries because they tend to have higher rates of suicide. And today, that's what I do every day as I help companies and organizations develop mental health strategies. So, uh, Dr. Sally, if you don't mind me calling you Dr. Sally. That's uh, fine. Thank you. Um, talk to me a little bit about how how impactful are suicides or or uh, uh, precursors that lead up this in construction specifically? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, many people have been well aware since the CDC came out with a report back in 2016 that construction has elevated risks of suicide, both for men and women. Um, and but it's not just suicide; it's also overdose, it's addiction. It's uh, anxiety, lots of different mental health experiences um, that are no small things. It's not like people are having a stressful day. These things are often having catastrophic and life-threatening impacts on the workforce, which of course doesn't impact just that person who died, but their whole crew, their whole organization, it has significant ripple effects. So I would say the impacts are, are really at this point catastrophic. If you were to compound this, this is just one of those out of the loop questions I, I tend to throw out there. You've got the construction industry, and then you've got people who are in the military who tend to go into the construction industry. And the military already has a a veteran uh, suicide rate that is is extremely high. Um, when you combine those two, this makes this problem even more profound. Correct? Yes and no. So yes, and the fact that we have not just the veterans, but a number of people who have, uh, I would say, precursor risk factors coming into the construction industry. Sometimes you have people who have had, you know, dif difficult childhoods, you know, and uh, sometimes you have people that are um, having a lot of, uh, you know, transitory life issues and, um, you know, financial problems. You know, we got all kinds of people that have uh, different challenges in their life coming into the construction industry at different points. Um, and so that's true for a lot of veterans, but what's also true is uh, the veterans bring a lot of wisdom around this. Um, many times they've had a lot of training and even leadership around this, and they uh, can be incredible mentors. I've seen the veteran community also be the ones to stand up like employee research groups around mental health and really take the to the lead and the charge because they know how important it is. So on one hand, yes, maybe we have elevated risk because of exposure to combat or the challenges of transitioning back to civilian life. But on the other hand, we've got great assets in our veterans to help lead the charge. That's awesome. Talk to me a little bit about um, as people are experiencing challenges, um, um, what is a good way for employers or is there a good way for employers to be able to identify uh, construction workers who might need uh, a little extra help or guidance or resources made available to them? Is there is there some things we should be looking for uh, from the entry level supervisor up to the owners of these companies? Well, there's a lot of reasons why the work workers will try to zip it up and pretend nothing is happening or try to suppress it. Um, there's a lot at stake for them. You know, discrimination is a real thing. Prejudice is a real thing. Not getting the good jobs is a real thing. So there's a lot of reasons why people are not forthcoming. Given that we know there's high rates across the board, employers and uh, leaders of our unions and our professional associations should all just assume it's on the menu, assume that these issues are already on the menu for a lot of their workforce, and then just do the right thing, um, rather than waiting for the big red flag to come swooping down, because a lot of times it's not its not going to be, you know, very apparent uh, for some people because they're able to, you know, push it down and hide it. Uh, so just assume it's on the menu and do the right thing. We have found when people feel safe, 
when they feel that somebody has their back and someone is there to help them, support them, understand them, they do open up. But giving, you know, especially a manager or a leader a clue uh, is is not often. It's not. It's more of a rare event. Uh, I'll I'll make a real share here. Um, uh, about a month and a half ago, uh, uh, a couple friend of my wife and I, um, we always go dinners together. Everything is a couple thing. And he asked me to come over on a off night. And and the conversation was is that uh, he was very depressed and he was looking for somebody that he could safely talk to. And I thought that was uh, 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 building off of what you said, if they feel safe, that they might open up. And that's where he felt safe in talking to me. And and I was able to uh, point him in the right direction uh, for him to to seek uh, some solutions and some some care. Um, uh, you know, so uh, what I would say is from the lay person's point of view is if someone wants to talk, listen and make a safe environment for them to feel like they can talk to you. Is there any, uh, anything else I should be doing on top That's of right. that? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, lot, there's a lot of nuance to being able to being a good listener. And one of the things in our trainings that we find that, uh, this industry really has a, has a challenge with is trying to fix the situation is try to take away someone's pain is trying to solve their problems for them because that's what that's what you do you solve problems all day you're really good at it but here it doesn't work so well so how do we get people to 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 get out of that mindset and believe me we just did this 3 day training advanced skills these people have already gone through hours and hours and hours of basic training they're still doing it they can't stop themselves it's so ingrained to try to fix problems so how do you how do you not give advice um and how do you do some really uh, nuanced things around listening deeply and validating and empathy and compassion? It's not as easy as you think. Um, and then secondly, another piece that you know caring um, supporters can do is they can um, be a bridge to resources. And not just by giving people a laundry list of referrals, but actually knowing a thing or two about what those uh, mental health resources do and maybe even kind of advocating towards them by, you know, saying, I'll go with you or let's make the call together. I've already used these resources or I know a thing or two about these resources. That kind of warm handoff uh, is much more likely to result in someone seeking resources than, you know, just giving them a 1-800 number. Yeah, I, I would certainly say from my vantage point, it wasn't be happy, call this person. So it was, it was, let's find places that can address your, your concerns. So, um, yeah, exactly. absolutely. Um, are there hurdles, um, to re to someone reaching out for help that we need to be aware of to try and remove as managers, um, barriers or hurdles to making people feel comfortable, want to talk? Are, are there any strategies that we should have in mind? There are so many. Then this is so it's not just the the workers' fault. There's a lot of barriers and 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 problems in in the chain of what we're trying to do here. Um, so number one is that most most organizations, um, if they have an employee assistance program, they have no idea what they do if people are utilizing them. They're just paying the monthly check, and uh, and that's all they know. Um, and so I encourage people to go kick the tires of their employee assistance program. And they usually find that it's, you know, not what they thought, unless they have a very top tier employee assistance program that's highly responsive and engaging in a partnership with them. Usually there's a lot of delay. Um, the, it just doesn't go smoothly. So that's one right. thing is that the mental health resources that many companies do have as part of their benefits package are incredibly clunky and difficult to navigate, even when people are well. All right. If you're trying to get into mental health services and you're not actually in a mental health crisis, it's hard. People, you know, lots of back and forth calls, a lot of processing of insurance and paperwork. And it's just frustrating. Now, imagine you're really compromised or you're having your worst day. That's an insurmountable task. So that's one thing. Another thing is that the way that traditional mental health resources are set up, um, it's just not convenient for a construction worker who's working, you know, 10, 12 hour days and have a massive commute. Uh, you know, you got to take time off from work. And that's just not something that people are willing to do. So it's been emerging pretty quickly since COVID, but it's not it's not yet. yet I would say uh, in a great place, but telemental health is an option 
But again, here, what, what employers and managers don't know is that there's a vast array of quality in those telemental health services, everything from behavioral health coaching, which is basically anybody can hold up a shingle and say they do behavioral health coaching. They need no credentials and no training to say that they do that all the way to one of my favorites, uh, Brightside Health, which um, every single person is a highly qualified licensed professional and they've all gotten extensive training in how to deal with mental health emergencies on telemental health. Now they're my go-to because I have lots of quality assurance in their responsiveness and their training. So, and, and everything in between. So that's another thing. Um, we also have kind of cultural and language barriers for a lot of the workers. There's not a lot of resources um, that are in Spanish and a lot of this, a lot of the construction workforce is uh, Spanish only or Spanish first. And you know, it's hard to, there's, there's tremendous amounts of cultural barriers in, in a lot of our um, Latino Hispanic communities for doing something like reaching out to mental health services. So there's a cultural barrier, there's a language barrier, uh, so all kinds of things. So that's on, I would say, the system side of things. On the worker side of things, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, cultural pieces as well. There's a lot of pride in being the tough person, being the provider, being the problem solver. Um, being someone who can get through a lot of stressful things and just hold it together and get stuff done. So this, you know, at least on first pass kind of flies in the face of that, that culture that people are really proud of. So there's, there's that piece, there's, a, there's, there's concern about, you know, being discriminated against, losing the work or not being able to get the promotions or the, you know, the really excellent job. So all of that needs to be addressed. The system side, and kind of the workers bias or stigma. Um, and the way that managers can lead that is modeling, modeling their own mental health, modeling the fact that they, you know, if they have used resources, found a benefit, modeling uh, discussions about this to bring down the fear of consequences and, you know, just recognizing and rewarding people who are leading in this space and looking out for one another. There's a ton that managers can do. In fact, we have you know, a full day course on how they can help champion culture, how they can address performance issues when there's a mental health driver and what they need to do in a mental health emergency. Because most of them just get deer in the headlights. They just don't know what to do. It wasn't part of their training, you know, and it seems so out of their lane. So tremendous amounts of things that can happen at the manager level and the leadership level to, to change culture and get organizations ready to face this with confidence, competence, and uh, really have a better outcome. So I'm a, I'm a systems guy. So when you talk about systems and how to do things, that, that is the basis of our business is creating systems. And, and, and I made a note, um, you know, as the owner of a consulting firm who does a, just a tremendous amount of work in the construction field, uh, one of the first notes I wrote is employee systems assistance program and to test the system out. That, yes, that was, exactly. That was a huge thing is pick up the phone and say, hey, I, I want to see how this works. How long would it take for me to to get a worker help if if I was that worker? You know, if I was that that person experiencing those challenges, you know, and then throw in the 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 hurdle of, hey, I have somebody who speaks Spanish only. What do I do um, th that systematically that that to me was to me one of the easiest things a manager can do that doesn't require the nuance, the yes. the 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 art form of of dealing with people. And, you know, as every manager who's worth their, their, their weight and salt will tell you it's, it's managing people is, is an art form, not a, not a, um, a, a transaction. So, so I, I really uh, latched on to the test out your system uh, and even, as a small even, business even, owner. Even as a secret shopper. So sometimes if you call the EAP and say, I have some questions, they put the marketing people on the phone and the marketing people are slick. They know how to get people excited about the services. They know all of the benefit statements to make so people are like yes of course would it be great much different experience sometimes to actually go through the process as someone who's benefiting from the service that's the real test and I, I say secret shopper but honestly i also truly believe that managers who haven't had some therapy should probably have some therapy you know yeah. just because everybody needs it and when you do it proactively you know maybe not when you're in a mental health crisis but you do it proactively because 
you know, everybody has something <laughs> that they're working on. There are no perfect humans out there. You, you have stress, you have conflict with your family, you have health issues you're dealing with, money, you know, all kinds of things that people are carrying. Going to a counselor helps you uh, make sure that you are in the best mental health state possible to deal with those or to make them better. Uh, so it's not just for mental health emergencies, it's also for everyday challenges. And if even if they just go to one or two sessions, they're gonna get an appreciation for the process or, sure. or they're gonna find out it's so clunky and dysfunctional, you know, when they're trying to go through it relatively well, they're, they're getting some appreciation of what it takes to access services when you're really struggling. So I would say right. all managers at least need to like try it on um, and understand how it works if they have it already. So part of uh, of our um, drive to do this in 2024 with Exceed Safety is that um, uh, we've committed doing one of these series each month for 2024, and this is our January one, is that I had a, uh, um, a co-worker of mine about, um, I'm going to say two years ago, two and a half years ago, um, actually co-workers, a, a a person I worked with in the past that I wasn't currently working with at the time reached out to me and they were commiserating or or, or telling me that their challenge is that they want to do this uh, telemed. Um, and the problem is that they traveled for work in construction and they wanted to have a counselor, but they were actually traveling through three or four states and some of these could not cross state lines through telemed. Mm -hmm. And and uh, he was actually able to talk to a supervisor and um, got uh, um, assigned to one project in one state for for a year so he could begin this this uh, telemed therapy. But that's one of those challenges yep. that as a supervisor, I want know to about. know. Yeah. What, and I, I couldn't imagine if he was Spanish primary language, how much right. more difficult that would be, because I'm without exaggeration. He told me he called 15 different no, organizations. Not uncommon. Not uncommon. And, and, you know, I, I, I'm happy that he was able to find a stationary assignment. Um, I don't think he actually spoke to his boss about it. No, I mean, again, I if you it. don't know what you're doing. Your yeah. inclination is just to go to Google and Google stuff. And of course, yep. what rises to the top of Google the people who pay the advertising dollars. If you don't have yep. the skills to actually understand what they're offering and ask them pointed questions about licensure and credentialing and what they're gonna do if someone is living with addiction or what they're gonna do if someone has expressed suicidal thoughts and you don't know what those answers are that you're looking for, like you are hunting in a forest for something that you don't even know what you're looking for, you know? So it's, it's very overwhelming. So we do need to prop up managers and I'm seeing this happening at an accelerated pace now. Um, you know, we started with awareness building. People needed to just spread awareness to get the idea that we may, maybe we have a problem here because you can't solve a problem you don't have. Right. But we are now in, a, in an exponentially um, accelerated rate, tipping up into strategy, into looking at all the the places where this shows up. It's not just the so-called troubled worker. You know, it shows up in safety. It shows up in employee engagement. It shows up in productivity. It shows up in so many areas, recruitment and retention of emerging leadership. Like all of these areas are connected right. to how um, your worker well-being in a very profound and direct way. So this is very exciting to me. So you had mentioned something about uh, uh, modeling behavior, supervisors, and them getting the additional training. Um, one of the things I've always been cognizant of in my career is that um, if I say, hey, I'm approachable, my office door is open, come on in, that does not equal somebody willing to walk into the owner of this company's office and have a conversation with me. So uh, one of the things I've always done is, is I've recognized that my field team doesn't want to come in here and sit down in the chair where other managers are very comfortable doing this, you know? Um, so what I have done, uh, and I'm interested in your feedback on it, is I have selected first line supervisors who are very approachable, very uh, worker centric. Uh, and then I have other managers who I've designated and had a conversation with saying, my open door policy is not going to work because people are intimidated by walking in my office. No matter what I do, they're intimidated. So I need them to be my filters so that the employee would feel good across the board at what a levels, man or woman, that they have those surrogates 
to get them help. And, and it, it is, is very much just organically developed by me. But I'm just kind of curious if, if on your view on that strategy. Yes, I would say both and. So but, and what I mean by that is when top leadership empowers management to own this as a part of their leadership, um, like excellent leaders do this. You know, they do walk around formal conversations about how people are doing one on one, you know, and the leader goes first in sharing, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, I have troubles at home because this work is really stressful. I'm wondering if that's true for you too. They don't have to share all of their darkest secrets, but if they model, like, this is important for us to talk about so we know, like, where your head's at. Because <laughs> um, I, sometimes my head is distracted by things going on outside of work or inside of work. Um, and I know I need to get my head straight to be, to be safe. So I would also say that top leaders also need to do that to some degree. Um, to walk around and also do a little self-disclosure. My my most impactful leaders, you know, have a, have the ability to say, here's why this work is important to our company or our organization. Here's why it matters to our mission. And they're able to connect the dots directly. Um, here's why it's connected to our core values. They connect it to the top level um, priorities of the organization. And then they say, and here's why it matters to me. And they're able to give just a little bit of a glimpse that everybody has issues. Everybody has either their personal things or things with their family members or loved ones or they've had loss. Because if the leader doesn't ever disclose anything, then here's the, here's the narrative. Everybody at the top's got it together. I want to rise in this organization, so I need to have it together and not disclose. And then nothing changes. So, Correct. Um, my secret sauce piece with the leadership is like, just find something you feel comfortable sharing. Obviously we don't want you to feel super vulnerable. Um, but like, for example, I had a chief of police say, um, I've certainly gone through times when I've been overwhelmed. Who hasn't, right? I've certainly gone through times where I've been overwhelmed. And when I found myself in that position, I needed to reach out to gain perspective, logical and fair enough, right? And he said, and, I, and when I did, I became better for it. I, I was a better leader, I was a better father, I was a better partner. I grew through that experience. That's all he needed to say. And then he said, so if you find yourself in the same position, I need you to come to me, because I get it. And I'm gonna fight with you to make sure that you get what you need so that we get you back here. You know, he just was such a, you know, transparent um, and forthright communicator about it. So I really appreciated his leadership. That is, that is extremely admirable. I, I, I strive to get to that level. I, I am the classic I share. They know if I'm at a good day, a bad day. <laughs> um, you know, our, 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 our staff clearly knows that. I want to switch gears a little bit, Dr. Sally, because we've talked a lot about the worker. We've talked a lot about leadership right here. Uh, and I, I think there's a pretty big uh, event coming up that you uh, are attending and that people can come out and hear you do this stuff and interact with you. Would you like to talk a little bit about some of your upcoming events that you have uh, uh, on your schedule? Yeah. So um, our organization, the United Suicide Survivors International, and uh, the other major suicide prevention, mental health promotion industry uh, leader, um, the Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention, our two organizations are co-hosting the Construction Working Minds Summit that's going to take place in Kansas City, February 26th to the 29th. Um, we are so excited. So the first year we had it in Denver, we had 200 people. That was 2022. In 2023, that was our second year. We doubled attendance in Kansas City. And we're anticipating somewhere between 400 and 600 people this year. We've expanded it from one day to four days. We have uh, like nine or so different pre-conference workshops where people can earn certificates or become certified trainers. Um, it's so exciting because we are really in a place where the theme of conference is, uh, you know, scaffolding and scaling, where we're building infrastructure to do this in a significant, comprehensive, sustainable, and strategic way. It's not good enough anymore to have an awareness event. Yes, awareness is important. You need to get a problem on the radar, but it's not sufficient for cultural change that we need to really see things stick. So it's also more than just a one-off training. One-off trainings may be impactful while they're in it or shortly after, 
Um, but just like CPR, we need to do refreshing. We need to have a stratified approach. So we've got a basic approach and an advanced approach and a leadership approach um, so that everybody has a role to play and they have skills that build are built on confidence and competence to do the right thing. And then beyond that, we need that strategy uh, to fix the systems issues and to make sure that the policies are in place that are really going to empower people to take care of their own mental health and so on and so forth. So to see this, uh, the industry kind of at a tipping point around that from kind of one-off case examples to really building out this uh, organizational, transformational, systems-wide approach is just, ah. And the other piece that's really exciting to me is that groups are coming together that normally can't speak to each other. Competitors that you know are always bidding, you know, on who's better. Um, labor and contractors that can't sit in the same room together. Everybody's pulling together here because they know this issue is bigger than their differences. This issue is 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 bigger than them, and it's really important for us to pull together and learn from each other. So I'm I'm completely thrilled. It's great that you have unions and professional associations stepping in. You've got some big boy contractors like J.E. Dunn, uh, yep. the United Association of Piping Trades, They're and presenting. Milwaukee Tool are all yep. major <laughs> sponsors of this event. It's it's uh, it, it sounds like an incredible event that that people need to pay attention and go to so that we can bridge that gap from being aware to taking being able to take action to prevent uh, uh, suicides. Exactly. And and even beyond taking action, like really thinking long term and strategy uh, kinds of things. And I'd also say the other way that we expand it is it's it's not just suicide prevention. It's not just mental health promotion um, in like the traditional sense of thinking about depression and anxiety. We're also tackling this year in a significant way addiction recovery um, that goes beyond substance use disorders. It's, it also includes things like gambling and sex addiction and money addiction and food addiction. Um, and and uh, overdose prevention. So we have a couple of sessions and even uh, a professional community that's developing around overdose prevention. So just to see the evolution of this community and their work in such a short period of time, uh, as a suicide loss survivor in particular, really warms my heart because it says people care. People, people really do care. And I couldn't imagine anywhere else uh, working right now because the construction industry does care and they also get stuff done. Awesome. You're listening to Safety Unlocked with our guest, Dr. Sally Spencer Thomas, president of United Suicide Survivors International. Dr. Sally, thank you so much for your time. So I guess in conclusion, I'll just say this is Sally Spencer Thomas signing off here. Grateful to be part of this podcast and uh, just to, to drive everyone to the Construction Working Minds website, which is um, on the United Survivors website. So if you Google Construction Working Mind Summit, it'll come up and we have an early registration deadline coming. Um, so if you don't want to be hit with the procrastinators penalty, get your stuff in before January 26th. And we also have scholarships. So if you know of students in construction or apprentices that might need a little travel support or registration support, um, we, our scholarship application deadline is January 31st. You have been listening to Safety Unlocked, The Morning Show, a podcast for safety people by safety people. Brought to you by Exceed Safety, a full spectrum consulting firm. Visit our website at exceedsafety.com or call us at 919-728-SAFE. Exceed Safety, LLC.